Welcome everyone to the third OSU Improvement Month interview today with Masta. What is up? Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm doing good. How well, about you? Let's go. I'm doing awesome. So for those who are not familiar with you, could you just give a brief introduction as to who you are as a player and what people might know you for? All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Masta, and I've been playing Osu for about three and a half years now. And I mainly started off playing the game very focused on improvement and climbed the ranks very fast. I think I went from 37k to 7k in around one month. And then when I was around 1,600, I went to 800 in two days. Yeah, two days. Oh so just gosh. went on insane. Yeah, I, I learned how to play DT. So it took me two days to p basically have my rank. And ever since around four digit, I've been very focused on playing tournaments. So I've played in four, uh, four VC, I've played in OWC, and I placed second in Sweden Cup. I think it was in uh, 2021 against Reed Cat. Oh, and, uh, dang, that's pretty good. Yeah, I guess that's my introduction. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think you're definitely well known for being a very active OC coach as well. Oh, I forgot to mention that as well. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I've coached about, I think about 300 people in total in Osu. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. So you have quite a lot of experience with that as well and sort of explaining yeah. concepts and oh, actually, could you sort of go through what a typical session might look like for you? Uh, all right. So a typical session is pretty much four parts. I usually start off by just explaining what we're going to be doing in the session and then we jump into the first step which is my warm-up routine so i pretty much just explain how i warm up and effective methods for that and then we move on to taking a look at the player settings because most of the time someone would be playing with not very optimal settings to say the least i've found maybe 20 or 30 people playing with like minus 50 offset I oh. think one guy had like minus 200 offset and he didn't even like he came to me very sad wondering why he wasn't improving. And then we took a quick look at, it, at his settings and we found out why. Oh, no. So, yeah, you always want to take a look at the settings, make sure that the player isn't playing with something that would be like bad or detrimental for them. And after that, I usually just send them maybe like six or seven maps just to kind of gauge their ability, find out where they are as a player. And then from there on out, we can move on to like more specific skill sets and take a look at what they need to do to get better at the game. And finally, of course, we end everything with a summary and discussion where we summarize everything and just wrap everything together neatly. I'm curious about the settings. Are there any settings other than the universal offset? being like completely off for example any other settings that you feel like are common like bad settings that you notice people use because a lot of the time i feel like it is largely preference even things like having the background on like if you prefer having the background on then like nothing bad will really happen but are there any mm -hmm. settings you feel like people should definitely look into if they if they use it uh i've seen a lot of tablet players use sensitivity in game instead of like using their tablet area and i've also seen a lot of uh what's it called i've seen a lot of players that play mouse play with an absurd amount of in-game sensitivity instead of changing their dpi and from what i know from talking to a lot of mouse players usually it's better to change your dpi and to not adjust the in-game sense too much Ah, okay, interesting. Do you know if there's a reason for that? I guess it's maybe about accuracy. Yeah, I think it has to do with like having more precise positioning. And a lot of people that play mouse also forget to put on raw input, which uh, is definitely something bad. You want to be playing with raw input if you play with mouse. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And although for tablet, is there uh, like, is there something bad that happens if you're using sensitivity instead of your tablet drivers? Uh, I'm pretty sure that it's possible for your tablet to like skip pixels, I think. Oh, I think okay. that was like the main thing that could happen. It doesn't happen that often, but since we're playing a game like Osu where you really have to be as perfect as possible, you'd want to play with something that is reliable. Right. That's true. That's true. 
So a couple of questions came in specifically for you. So I'm going to go through these first. So the right. first question is anonymous and they said, to Masta, would you say that being healthy benefits improvement faster slash making it easier to have stamina because your arms weigh less as you become skinnier? Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, okay. Uh, um, interesting question. Uh, I guess you can tackle literally what they said, although uh, now that I read it all the way through, I assume they're joking. But you can also touch on sort of, do you feel like having a healthier lifestyle, like eating well, sleeping well, things like that, and exercising, do you feel like that benefits improvement at all? Or if it doesn't make that big of a difference? I mean, in general, just for your health, it's probably good that you get a decent amount of sleep, preferably at least like eight hours that you eat good food that isn't like processed, like you're not eating junk food every day or fast food and that you have some sort of exercise routine. But if we have to relate it to improvement, I wouldn't really say it matters too much because uh, if I recall correctly, Emrek mainly just like ate fast food when he was <laughs> popping off. He was like eating KFC and talk, uh, like tweeting on Twitter saying that he didn't have enough money for KFC anymore. And oh, no. Yeah, that he didn't have the best like sleep schedule either. So no, I wouldn't really say that there are too many benefits like related to Osu. But in general, yeah, you can pretty much just change your entire life by having good sleep, good uh, just like diet habits and exercise habits. But I do remember practicing or uh, like when I was four digit, I started trying to work out my forearms as much as possible because I thought that would somehow correlate to stamina. And I, I don't know if it's placebo or not, but I did see some stamina improvements after working on uh, forearms. Yeah, I've heard some people say that like forearm strength or like stamina in the gym isn't really the same as like stamina or like strength in osu i guess so i've definitely heard reports of people saying that like there isn't really much of a correlation there but yeah. it's, the way i like to put it is like we can't really say if having a healthier lifestyle will necessarily make you improve in osu but it's definitely going to improve your quality of life so worst case scenario you fix your eating and sleep and you start exercising and your quality of life improves so if you don't yeah. quite improve at osu then i'm sorry to hear that but at least you are living a healthier life yeah i mean in general osu is also a very heavy like mindset focused game and if you're not getting enough sleep and you're not really exercising or eating good food that could lead to it being hard to have a good mindset while playing because you might just be very tired or very like energy deficient i guess yeah, when you're yeah, playing that's true so yeah you definitely want to make sure that you're at least getting good sleep eating good food and working out because it could help a lot with mindset yeah i think the one out of those three that's most important for improvement would definitely be sleep because that's yeah. really where your brain sort of like recovers from the practice that you did and sort of incorporates it and you can wake up feeling nice and recovered and have all that skill sort of wrapped inside of you i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember uh trying to like stay awake for 24 hours because i my sleep schedule was just completely destroyed and i thought to myself hey why not just play some osu and see how it goes and <laughs> yeah it was, it was terrible like i was missing on things i was very comfortable on like mainly mainly triples i couldn't consistently do triples because i would like blink and then just miss everything oh no <laughs> so yeah sleep is important yeah, yeah. If nothing else, definitely sleep. Yeah. So the next question comes from Slowdinks, who said, Hey, Master, what are your thoughts about tech maps? Tech maps are probably the most fun maps in the game, in my opinion, because there's so many cool things you can do with tech maps, but they're also very, very hard to get into. And most players don't truly get to experience good tech maps until they get to like, I guess around four digit, because that's when you can start to play the really, really harder tech maps. But it also depends on like how much tech you play and how much you practice, because most tech maps are also going to be very hard. And tech is kind of like its own skill set. You need a lot of control in all of your skill sets to be able to play tech. Yeah, tech is definitely that type of map that sort of incorporates everything. It yeah. has 
a couple streams, a couple jumps, but then it also has these sort of weirder patterns and rhythms that you might not find in other maps. I remember hearing、mm. some people say, like, oh, I wish I was a tech player from the beginning because then I would have learned how to hit stupid sliders and I would never miss on sliders. <laughs> so,、oh, no.、Um, yeah, I, I don't know. But I definitely think that from an improvement standpoint, like, if you only had to play one style of map, I think tech maps will definitely give you a bit of everything. There's even some, like, some speed incorporated in tech maps. So, and some alternating sometimes as well. So, you, you really get a little bit of everything in those maps. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that mainly playing tech maps would give you a very like, varied and well rounded skill set, but it also depends on when you start playing tech maps because I wouldn't really recommend like six digits to play tech, really. There isn't really too much to be gained from spamming tech maps when you don't have like, the basics of the game completely mastered. Well, But that's just my opinion. Right. I mean, th- that's definitely fair. I would say there's like some very light tech maps that like top players probably wouldn't think of as tech, but stuff around、yeah. the low four star range that you can still sort of start dipping your toes into that style of mapping. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's fine. That's, that's completely fine then. But、right. just like mainly being focused on tech maps as a six digit usually doesn't. Lead to good results from what, I, from,、uh, from what I've seen personally. Right, right. <clears throat> All right. So, next question is anonymous and says Question goes to Master. How do you deal with cold hands and the inability to stream because of that? Ooh, this is a very good question because it's something I've had to deal with for so long. So, I live in Sweden and I live in the northern part of Sweden.、Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, right about now is when. Playing Osu kind of becomes a chore, and warm up usually takes forever. And I need to find some way to combat just the coldness of my hands without going completely insane and letting it ruin my mental. And the main things I found is you need to. You need to have eaten something, something. You need to have eaten good food or something that pretty much makes your hands warm. So、and you, you, you said you need to have eaten something? Yeah, just like food in general, because I usually find that if I haven't eaten something, it's going to be very hard for my hands to get warm. And my body will usually just prioritize everything else except for my hands and my feet when I play. <laughs> and that, yeah, it's a recipe for disaster. So eating something is a very good idea. Uh, then also making sure that you run your hands under warm water while doing hand wrist exercises. I've also found that to help. And funnily enough, I have、uh, a friend who always tells me that the reason why my hands are so cold is because I don't have socks on. And I took his advice. I was like, all right, let me put some socks on. And that does help a lot. Yeah, you want to always have on socks while playing as well. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, I think. Especially since I guess, like, if you're able to cover the bottom of your feet, where、yeah. that's sort of where heat could potentially escape your body. So that definitely、yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And then people also say that you could, like, <laughs> or I remember seeing on Twitter someone use the hairdryer or something on their hands.、Uh, I haven't <laughs> tried that one out yet, but hey, it might be worth trying. Oh, I remember that. That clip is so good. I don't remember、yeah. who it was. Oh my god. I think, was, I think it was Rampax, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, I yeah. knew it started with an R.、Um, yeah, oh my god. He, like, he paused the map. He was like, oh, my hands are so cold. He grabbed a, a hair dryer and he just started blowing his hands aggressively. It's so funny.、Uh, yeah.、Um, so basically, make sure you've eaten something and try having socks on or something to cover that part of your feet, basically. And- yeah. Is, are there any other main things? Like, are, are there specific ways that you would want to warm up when your hands are really cold?、Uh, that's a good question. I would just pretty much try to destroy my hands as much as possible without、oh. actually like, damaging them. Because the thing is, you kind of have to overcome this, I guess, barrier of cold or like the threshold for when your hands actually start getting warm. And that doesn't usually happen unless you've, like, one, or A, either been playing for a long while, or B, just destroyed your hands in one way or another. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would usually think that if your hands are cold, then you kind of just want to warm up slower because it's just going to take longer for your hands to heat up. So, like, 
playing more yeah, gradually, but- I would imagine. Is that also something you would recommend? Or I mean, or maybe you can just elaborate on what you mean by like destroying your hands. Okay, so the two options are A, either destroying your hands, which means that you pretty much just play stuff that's very taxing for your hands not to the point where you like it like it starts hurting but you need to really be pushing your hands as much as possible and then over time gradually you will get warmed up and then b that would be to do your method and gradually warm up but the thing is that would usually take me like maybe 45 minutes to an hour and I usually don't have that much time to warm up, so I'd rather just get through my warm up as fast as possible, so I can actually move on to playing what I want to play. Ah, okay, okay, that that definitely makes sense. So, yeah, so if you have time, you could definitely go and play, uh, just like as many warm up maps as you want, and really just take your time getting warmed up. But I'm assuming most people don't want to sit there for an hour warming up. Yeah, I've heard some people mention like running your hands under warm water or taking a warm shower yeah. if that's possible. Um, so yeah, but the warm shower thing is kind of it kind of works, but it doesn't always work because uh, after I've taken the warm shower, I might just sit down to play, and then after thirty minutes, I might notice that my hands are getting cold again. Oh yeah, okay, that actually makes sense. So one yeah. thing I do know is that if you are like t- if you take a warm shower, for example then Mm -hmm. your body tries to compensate for that heat by actually cooling down more and vice versa um yeah 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 okay that that actually makes sense that it wouldn't always work but i do think at least just running your hands under warm water probably works a little better yeah definitely i i do a combination of pretty much everything so running my hands under warm water and then just playing maps that push my hands as much as possible without damaging them of course and I also let time do its thing. And that usually helps me get warmed up when it's cold. Are there any hand exercises or stretches or things like that that you try to do in general, maybe not only when you're cold, but is there any, do you feel like that helps with cold hands? Yeah, it, it definitely, ah, cold hands, I'm not really sure. But in general, yeah, it definitely helps. I always do uh, Dr. Levi's hand and wrist exercises. Ah, yeah. So, I mean, do you do like all the steps in that video? Because one of them is like run your hands under warm water for a while and then i think in the middle of the video is where there's actual exercises i mean do, mm-hmm. do you feel like following the entire video is necessary or do you mostly just do the stretches i'd say it kind of depends on how i feel but i generally make sure to always do the stretches and then if uh, i feel like okay i should probably take a break now cuz he recommends taking a break every 1 hour of playing for about 5 minutes and if I feel like, okay, I really need this break, then I'm going to definitely take one. Or if I feel like my hands are getting really, really cold and I, for example, have a tournament in 10 minutes, then I'm going to go and run them under the hottest water possible oh, without yep. damaging them, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So there's another question that came in from Young TPLC who asked, what is your opinion on long stream maps? Okay. In my opinion, long stream maps is the biggest scam in Osu. I don't think long stream maps are good for anyone until you get to a very specific point in the game where you really need to practice your tapping technique in a certain way. And that doesn't really happen until you're like at least around four digit level or a high five digit level. And the reason I'm saying this is because I've seen so many players, especially newer players, spend so much time on these long stream maps, just focusing on them, grinding them, hyper focusing on them even. And what that leads to is usually the opposite effect of like what the player wants. The player is playing the maps because they want to learn how to stream and get good at it, but they don't realize that they most likely don't even have the fundamentals necessary to start practicing that way. And most players are able to learn how to stream to a very good level just by playing like regular no mod one type maps. So maps that are focused on consistency, have a lot of jumps in them and have triples and bursts here and there. And then over time, you're going to be able to get good that way. And then when you get to around high five digit or four digit, that's when you can start putting a lot more time into streams if you want to. And I've seen this happen time and time again. For me, I sucked at streams and then I got to around four digit skill level. And then I just spent 
I think two or three weeks, maybe even a month, practicing streams every session. I didn't only play streams, but I put heavy emphasis on them and I made sure to analyze everything. And I got good at streams in a month. I went from not being able to stream to being able to farm stream maps. And I've also seen this happen with two of my friends, one of them being also a four digit. I think he was ranked 7000 and he wasn't able to stream whatsoever. And he had what he needed to start learning. And that's when he did. And he got really good at streams really fast. So most players that are six digit or five digit might be spending so much time focused on these streams when they're not in like the position where streams are even unlocked for them, if that makes sense. They're trying to practice something that isn't unlocked in their skill tree yet. Oh, that's that's actually interesting. So would you say so? I mean, basically what I heard is that like you should start out with just kind of aim and consistency and getting kind of used to the game. And then from yeah. there, you can branch out to streams. Yeah, exactly. Because the thing with streams is a lot of players, especially newer ones, see like streams as uh, not the end game. I don't really know how to put it into words. They don't really see like the different levels of streams. Like first you have triples, then you have regular bursts, then you have longer bursts, then you have like straight streams that don't really require that much aim. Then you have straight streams that are longer, and then you have straight streams that require more aim and so on and so on. And eventually you get to the point where you are doing space streams. But most players just see it as, oh, long stream maps. I have to learn how to do this when they're not able to properly do triples or regular bursts yet. And that is just a recipe for disaster, in my opinion. That's interesting because I've always imagined that like streams are still something you can build up gradually, just like you would build up your aim as a newer player, mm -hmm. where like you start out with like 230 or 240 BPM, like generic maps that are like mostly single taps and some triples and then yeah. like Senya maps or something like that no mod and then you can build up to like some simple like burst maps as well and just sort of gradually building out from a beginner player to like basically following that track you're talking about but without becoming a jump player first if that makes sense is that something I that mean, you feel like is okay as well i mean the thing with that is it sounds good in in theory but in actuality that usually doesn't happen for many players usually that is a very very rare occurrence from what i've seen and it has to do with players uh, how do i explain this um it's mainly that the time that it takes to actually get good at streams when you start practicing practicing them as a newer player is kind of wasted time because as i said i learned how to stream in like three weeks getting to the point where i could do uh, stream farm maps and I've seen two other people do the exact same thing when they were ready to actually start learning streams so the question is should you spend a bunch of time gradually getting better at streaming or should you just have that period where you're like okay I'm gonna focus on streams for a while and then you get really good and then you don't have to like work on it gradually and have it at in like in the back of your mind while you're playing so that's like the question which is m more effective and in my opinion, the one that's more effective is probably the one where you're already very good at like regular maps and now you're ready to tackle streams. Oh, OK, that makes well, so basically what I'm hearing is that if you just focus on like some more generic types of maps without worrying about streams, you're still kind of building up that fundamental basis of, yeah, of tapping. Exactly. And then once you reach a certain point, then you're like already almost there. And so once you start focusing on streams, then then it'll come a lot faster. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. And that's the reason why it works for a lot of people, like, like people that just completely suck at streams. They don't really know how to do them, but they're kind of good at everything else. And then they're like, OK, well, time to learn streams. They give it a month and now they can start farming stream maps. And it's pretty much the same thing with any skill set, really. It's like when you see top players that are good at everything, but they suck at this one skill set. Most top players, if they actually take the time to practice that skill set, will get good really fast. And I think examples of that would be Emrek 
or Vaxe or even White Cat, because I remember people said uh, when White Cat got, got unbanned and he started setting plays, people were like, oh, they, everyone was trying to find an excuse as to why he was worse than Vaxe. So <laughs> they were like, oh, well, he, he can't stream. So he's, he's worse than Vaxe. And then a month goes by and now White Cat can stream. Right. So the thing is, most players that already have very good base uh, fundamental or like mid-level gameplay skills can usually learn the other skills quite easily and if you have very very high gameplay skills then you can learn the like other skills even more easy like there there's they become super easy if you're already at a very high level the only issue is that when you're at for example my level in your three digit playing hidden which is like the skills that i suck at the most uh then it, it's just kind of painful because you're going from a point of being really good at pretty much everything to playing something that you suck at. And then it, it just becomes a mental battle. But other than that, every skill set becomes easier to learn when you already have other skill sets in place. Right. For, for hidden in particular, the, the way I always like to describe it, it's kind of like, um, like print writing versus cursive writing in English, for example where there's kind of two like everything means the same but it just mm -hmm. kind of looks different and even though you are already most likely like f so in america we learn cursive which is basically like a different script used for handwriting in the past and we would l i think we started learning that in third grade so around seven to eight years old and you start learning from the alphabet all over again even though you're already pretty good at English by that point. And the reason is because you just have to get really familiar with what everything looks like. And some letters look exactly the same, but some letters are kind of unrecognizable. So just for the sake of getting you situated with what everything looks like, then you end up starting with the alphabet all over again. But it's not like you're relearning everything from scratch. Like once you get the alphabet kind of down, then mm -hmm. you so still have all that like basic understanding of what everything means. And I think basically the same analogy applies to Osu, where when you're learning hidden, in my experience, I think it really helps to like pretend you're a brand new player again and just get used to and this process is probably going to be a lot faster than you might think. So it's not like, oh, I have to start over all over again. It's more like get used to what patterns look like with hidden and like kind of playing them individually as if you're like giving advice to a brand new player. And from there you'll get used to what objects look like with hidden and from there that process will speed up really really quickly once you get used to that then you can basically just apply that to all the types of maps that you're already able to play yeah i i definitely agree with you because when i started off playing hidden i always just played hidden at my current like no mod skill level so i never tried to play easier stuff and even though i was practicing a lot of hidden i didn't really notice any improvement so I decided one day to just go and play some banger two stars and three stars with Hidden. And I noticed almost like instant improvement because the patterns were so basic that I could actually focus on the reading aspect. And from there on out, I just slowly but surely worked my way up and tried to expose myself to as many patterns as possible. And over time, I went from not being able to play Hidden at all, getting 100k in hidden one and hidden two to being able to get like hidden one fcs and like maybe on a good day 300k on hidden two because hidden two is always going to be hard for me oh yes and hidden hidden two for those who don't know are, is the low approach rate hidden map usually in tournaments so yeah you, you'll you'll get there you'll get there trust me just um <laughs> uh, what i have found is that like mid to high three stars is actually a really good range for practicing like putting fundamentals together or like solidifying like reading in that sense or like synchronizing your aim and tapping so yeah i would definitely well what, what i would probably do to strength because especially older like high like 3.9 3.8 star maps those maps are kind of crazy <laughs> so yeah but they're simple enough still or like kind of basic enough that you can s just focus only on the reading aspect like you mentioned I want to go back to long stream practice maps for a little bit, just to sort of define what we mean by that. Like, would you say that maps like Blend S or Gate Openers 
or Castellan's Midorigo, those sorts of like stream practice maps, but it's not just a one constant stream. Are those okay to use for practice or, oh uh, yeah, like how would you define what a long stream practice map is? All right. So yeah, I would say that using Blend S as an example, that is a completely acceptable map. Yes, you can practice with it. And uh, the main reason I kind of have th these ideas and how I kind of came to these conclusions was because was uh, when I was new to the game, I remember watching Idki play and I remember a very specific clip of him saying that long stream map or long uh, stream practice maps aren't that good for you because they don't really help you learn streams in like real environments, I guess, in real situations. Sure, they can be decent for practicing tapping, but most players have a lot more to worry about than just their tapping. And I remember that he recommended that you should play Gorshit maps. So I would say that you should pretty much just avoid long stream maps that are, uh, I think those like rectangular or square stream yeah, maps. Yeah. Those are just keep going in a square. Yeah, because they are very, very isolated and very, very focused on like tapping. N nothing else really. And... Uh, yeah, it's just better to practice with something like Blend S or let's say Tower of Heaven. I would say Tower of Heaven is a very good like beginner stream map or something you can learn streams with. But even maps like Blend S, Gate Openers, all of those types of maps, they also have a certain like entry difficulty level to them. So it's not like I'd recommend a like six digit to practice Blend S. I think that's too soon. Right. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And as you mentioned, I think I sort of think of long stream practice maps the same way, where mm -hmm. it's super, super, super isolated on just your tapping and nothing else. And the vast majority of people probably have more to worry about than just that, especially where like, if you're practicing on actual stream maps, you get a little bit of tapping practice, as well as the like reading and aim and finger control aspect of playing actual streams, which yeah. is going to help people a lot more than just trying to isolate tapping and nothing else. There is some value in isolating your tapping, but it's not the same that a lot of people might think it is. It's it's yeah. for like, if you really need to isolate your tapping for some reason, which again, and as you're mentioning, like the vast majority of players aren't like that. Um, yeah, that I think is a pretty good way to to describe those maps. Yeah. All right, so another question came in to you from Seedcrack, who asked, to Masta, what are the signs that make you think this is not a good day for Osu? And if you are rage slash burnt out at Osu, what games do you play instead? All right, so the signs that I should turn off Osu and do something else instead. Well, usually it would be that I just don't feel like I'm in the mood to play Osu because there's always something you can do in Osu. There's always something you can practice. And if I feel very off on a certain day, I would usually just go and practice my weakest skill set or just play maps for fun and maybe practice something like consistency. But other than that, I would pretty much just go off how I feel. It doesn't really have to do too much with how I perform, but when you get better at the game or where when you're at like a higher level of a game uh, or a higher level in the game, you become or you can become very, I wouldn't say like pessimistic or you can become kind of a, like a perfectionist, I guess, because in my case, I've had periods where I've just been completely popping off and just destroying everything I play. And the issue with those sort of periods is that, or as humans in general, we like to compare things and compare ourselves with other people or our own performances. And as I said at the start of this interview, I went from 37,000 to 7K in one month, and I went from 1,600 to 800 in two days. So those are massive, insane pop-offs. And having those in your kind of history can make it very tough to play mentally because if you don't have good days or days where you don't perform well and you don't get scores or you don't really get the FCs that you're looking for, you kind of just want to quit out. So you kind of have to separate how you perform from how you feel, I guess. 
it's it's really hard to put into words, but I mainly just go off of how I feel instead of how I perform. Because I could be playing like really bad some days, but I'm just really enjoying this particular anime song for some reason. So I just keep playing. Uh yeah, that that definitely makes yeah. a lot of sense. There's there's a similar question on the mm -hmm. on the sheet from Hollow Gamer who asks, "What do you do when you lack motivation?" Ooh, this is a good question. Um, well, this is kind of hard to put into words as well, because what what is motivation even like? That's also a question we should be asking ourselves. Uh, but in, in this case, I think motivation kind of just comes and goes it's not really something you can rely on and if you want to get good you kind of just have to do it every day you kind of just have to brute force yourself into playing every day and try to make it fun now if you notice that you're not motivated for like an extended period of time like you've been playing for let's say three weeks in a row and you're kind of just not having fun whatsoever you're just playing for the sake of playing then maybe you should reevaluate why you're playing osu or why you're playing just games in general if there's maybe something else you want to do if there's something else you want to focus on because usually games are meant to be fun right and if you want to get good at a game like osu it requires a lot of time and you have to really be in it for the long run so Relying on motivation is not something I would recommend. You kind of just have to get used to playing the game and trying to make the game as fun as possible. Yeah, I think those points, especially about sort of asking yourself why you're playing in the first place is really important in those times. Yeah. And I think if, if I had to sort of define motivation or the way that I think about it is mostly mm -hmm. that it's more of an emotional state rather than i don't know anything else like a character trait like yeah it's it's similar to saying like oh it's uh, so if you say like oh it's i want to be motivated all the time it's kind of like saying i want to be happy all the time or i want to be sad all the okay well you yeah. can say that but yeah i know um, what you mean it doesn't yeah. really work right so you can't like force yourself to stay in that state all the time so I think yeah. that's especially dangerous because like motivation can come and go just like any other emotion. But if you're relying on motivation to keep yourself working towards your goals, then most likely you're going to fall off before you make any significant progress just because motivation can only last so long. And the way that I've heard it described, which I somewhat agree with, is that motivation is, and like sort of thinking about where you want to end up, is a really good way to get started working towards something. But once you're sort of on that journey already, usually what can keep you on that path more, like, I guess better, is thinking, instead of thinking of, of where you want to go, is sort of thinking about what would happen if you didn't achieve that goal. And sort of motivating yourself in the opposite direction. Not really of like trying to scare yourself or being like afraid of failure, but sort of, almost in a sense of regret in a sense where you want to try thinking about what would happen if you kind of stopped working towards whatever it is but yeah as you mentioned as well sort of grounding yourself in your original reason for working towards that thing can also be a really good way to keep yourself motivated and sort of writing down the reasons when you start out because you might think that you'll always remember them but if you've been playing for like three or four years and like you're kind of starting to forget why you started in the first place i think going back to those original reasons can can kind of keep you grounded again and keep you going yeah i definitely agree with everything you said and i think this is also kind of a hard question to answer for a lot of top players or players that have made it far in osu because for me personally motivation was never really an issue osu kind of like was the main thing i was focused on for two to three years so that was like the thing i'd i'd play or do if i was bored and i had nothing to do i'd play osu if i uh, wanted to have fun i'd play osu if i 
was sad for any reason I'd play Osu. So it's like, that was the main thing I focused on. But during that entire time, it never really felt like a chore to play the game. I never really felt like I had to convince my place, uh, convince myself to play Osu. It kind of just happened. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And especially some, I think if you're reaching the point where you're like, oh man, here we go. Gotta, gotta get on and play my 30 minutes of stream practice and get my stamina practice uh in in some sense like if if you know that you're just kind of trying to work towards a bigger goal and you're just kind of relying on discipline which definitely is not a bad thing but if you're finding that every single session you kind of feel like you're forcing yourself to get on then like i think taking a step back and asking yourself why you want to get better in the first place is going to be really helpful yeah and that's very good for or very good advice for pretty much everything in life, really. Because a lot of people are doing certain things or want to learn certain skills, but they never really ask themselves why beyond the like initial high of, oh shit, I can actually learn this thing. This would be super cool if I could do this. Right. And in my case, I was kind of going through that because I wanted to learn Japanese. So I started learning Japanese, made it really far. And then in the middle of everything, I was like, wait, why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I doing this now again? <laughs> And yeah, from there on, you kind of have to reassess everything and really understand what your goals are, what you want in your life. And yeah, pretty much just get a better understanding of why you're doing things. Right. If I had to relate this quickly to the topic of addiction, just think, because I think it's relevant. I would say a good way that I found to think about addiction is if you can't stop doing something that you don't want to do. So in the case of a game, for example, it's like, let's say you don't actually want to play the game, but at the same time, you can't, you can't get yourself to stop doing it. That's, I think, if you find yourself relating to that in, in any activity, really, then I think that's where you might want to, again, take a step back and try to recognize, or like, I guess, recalibrate your priorities or whatever your activities are that you're doing. Yeah, completely agree. All right. So switching topics, there's an anonymous question that asks, mm -hmm. where do you look when you play a map? Does it change depending on patterns, note density, or AR? I pretty much try to look at every note, no matter what I'm playing. And it usually depends on if we like relate it back to like what AR I would be playing or the different patterns I'd be playing. On some patterns, I might have to look a bit more ahead when I'm playing and on some maps or patterns I might have to try and look uh, closer to where my cursor is so if I'm playing a lot of uh, lower AR I usually try to keep my vision closer to my cursor I'm still looking at every note and like trying to move from note to note with my eyes but I just try to go a bit slower and try to stick closer to my cursor and then if I'm playing something like faster if I'm playing let's say uh, AR 10.5 DT then I'd be looking a few, I'd try to look a lot further ahead, but I'd still be reading every note individually. And most people think that it's kind of impossible to do. Like, how, how do you look at every note? How do you, like, divide patterns up into smaller bits? It's, it's so hard to do, but it really just comes with practice. And when you do practice this and you try to look at every note and you make it like your main objective when playing, eventually you'll be able to do it on maps like Lonely Go. Because that's the level I'm at right now, where I can pretty much look at every single note when playing the seven star diff of Lonely Go. So the cross screen jumps. And this is also the one thing that time and time again has helped me really just crush my barriers and become really good. Uh, when I went from 37k to 7k, that's when I realized that, hey, maybe I should stop looking in the middle of my screen and actually try looking at the notes revolutionary idea <laughs> and it, it actually worked so i was kind of shocked when that happened but yeah it helped me go from 37k to 7k and then the same thing when i was going from 800 to or 1600 to 800 i noticed when i was playing dt that i was reading way too close to my cursor and that i should maybe try to look a bit more ahead and try to read faster since the map is going so fast and when i did that i pretty much unlocked every 500 pp map and even some 600 pp maps in one night so oh wow yeah 
there are a lot of like small changes you could make that could give you very big results, but it also depends on what you like your biggest bottleneck is, I guess. For me, my biggest bottleneck has always been reading. So that's why I've been like so focused on trying to fix it. And each time I've been able to fix my biggest bottleneck, I've seen great improvements. Yeah, reading is one of those skills that I think can be really tricky. And I, I think the focus aspect in particular, where it can be a bottleneck for a lot of players without them really recognizing it. So yeah. I think it's really good that you bring that up and, and really emphasize how that has helped you. Because I think just shifting the way you focus and read patterns, even just a little bit, can give a lot, a lot of value to your gameplay as a whole. And I, I sometimes find that like, if I'm struggling on a certain map and I'm just kind of grinding it over and over and I'm like, you know, what if I try actually focusing on the map? Like just, it's, it's okay, it sounds worse when I say it out loud like that, but it's like, let me try like focusing more on my reading than anything else. And that's really where I sometimes find the most value for like not as much effort as you might think. So yeah, definitely a very good point. I want to also emphasize or ask you about resolution since you're talking mm -hmm. about looking at each circle and sometimes especially cross screen jumps can get very overwhelming with trying mm -hmm. to do that do you feel like it's better to use a smaller game resolution or what are your thoughts on resolution as a whole okay so this is a very good question because this is something i've experimented with a few times so i remember when i started off playing i was mainly playing on laptop with a tablet connected to it and a mechanical keyboard connected and my brother was the only one in the family that had a PC, like a regular PC. So I would usually switch between playing on my laptop and then playing on my brother's PC. So I'd usually switch between resolutions very often. And that's also like the first thing. Don't mess with your settings too much. Don't do what I did and like switch between setups. That is never a good thing. And if you like play mouse and tablet, definitely stick to one. Don't switch between them. But anyways, back to what I was saying. Uh, for me, resolution has always been very interesting because when I finally got my first PC and my first like actual screen, I had very, very little desk space and overall very little space because my bed was right behind my chair and right in front of me was my desk. And I was maybe like, I don't know, like half a meter or less away from my monitor. So I was very, very close oh my to God. my monitor. Yeah, I was super close. And I noticed that I kind of sucked at jumps. I couldn't really read jumps properly because I didn't really have enough time to see them. And yeah, this made me very bad at jumps. So I was like, okay, let me see if I can fix this. So I switched to a smaller resolution and it did help. I played with smaller resolution for, I think when I was between like rank 20K and eight or 7K, somewhere around there. So for a while I played with... Uh, a smaller resolution but i kind of noticed this weird phenomenon where it it kind of feels like i have less time to react on smaller resolutions it feels like i'm playing kind it's kind of harder to play with a smaller resolution overall so i eventually tried switching back to uh 1920 by 1080 and i noticed that it it sounds dumb but it felt like i had more time to react when playing and i had more just more I could uh, deal with. Like I can make everything a lot easier for myself if, if I was playing with a bigger resolution. And the final like conclusion I came to was that you shouldn't be that close to your monitor. If you can sit like one meter or something away, like if you just extend your arm out to the monitor, if you're just barely touching it, that should be fine. Or if you're yeah. almost touching it, that should also be fine. But you kind of need to see your entire screen. Otherwise, looking at every note and like moving your eyes can be very, very difficult. Oh, that's a good point. I, I didn't actually consider when I was asking the question about like the distance between you and the monitor. But yeah, yeah that's also definitely, I think it's important to kind of strike that balance between the size of your game. Because there's definitely some people who have like really, really big monitors. And yeah. I think for those people, it's probably like you do want to find a sweet spot of like, you don't want it to be too big to where you kind of have that same problem. So. Yeah, exactly. And that's something I didn't really ever think about either until I 
tried like playing on my setup and then I tried uh, playing on my brother's setup like my uh, my setup with like an actual monitor this time and then I compared it to playing with my brother's setup and I was a lot further away from the monitor then and I noticed that on my setup I couldn't really do jumps but on my brother's setup I could do jumps and I found that to be very annoying because there was no real way to fix my issues with my setup so I kind of just had to suck suck at jumps for a while until I finally got everything fixed. Oh, I see. But yeah, so I, I assume now you're on your own PC? Yeah. Dang, let's go. <laughs> so there's another similar question, and you somewhat touched on this in your last answer, but this is an anonymous question who asked, what do you think about players that always change their tablet area in a short amount of time and can still produce good plays? And do you think this has any relation to the player's muscle memory? Ooh, that is a very good question. Um, in general, I personally don't recommend changing your settings up too often. Usually, you don't really need to change your settings. It's not usually going to be your tablet area that messes you up. But I have seen players that do switch frequently, but still play very well and i'm not really sure what it is i think that some people are just very good at adapting to new situations like for me i could switch my tablet area and probably get used to it within an hour or two but i obviously wouldn't be as consistent but i could still kind of get used to it but for some people it might take them like two or three days of playing to finally feel like they've kind of gotten used to it and my theory is it might have to do with your reading as well because I don't really know how to put it into words, but if you can clearly see where your cursor is going and where you're supposed to be going, getting used to playing can become a lot easier. But if you're mainly looking at like the middle of your screen and reading with your peripheral vision, then getting used to changes is probably going to be more difficult. Yeah, I think the reading aspect that you mentioned is especially important there because yeah. I also find that... well. There, might, I think there's like two sides to this sort of muscle memory thing. One is like associating a specific distance that your fingers move with a specific location on the screen. And one is like after you change your area or sensitivity, mm -hmm. you can adapt to instead of relating the finger movement to a location on the screen, you relate it to how much your cursor has moved. And you you basically adapt to like relative cursor movement based on the new sensitivity or area that you've chosen and i think for a lot of people it i think it's more of like being afraid to change their tablet area but i feel like a lot of people will most likely find it not too hard to recalibrate if they change their tablet area a little bit because yeah let's say you make your area smaller you start over aiming for a little bit and then after like three or four maps you're like okay i'm i've been over aiming so let me like kind of adjust and sort of readapt to like how much my cursor is moving when I move my pen or mouse. And yeah, I would say as far as like people who can change their area all the time, it probably does have to do with reading and having a really good sense of their cursor location and how their yeah. cursor moves. But at the same time, most people that do change their areas often, like let's say maybe every other or third session, they usually don't change it by that much though. Like, uh, I don't remember, but I think it was Spare. Spare changes his area quite often. I think uh, Cookiezy does as well. Yeah. But it's not like changes are like massive. They're just like usually changes of like half a centimeter or something or less. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair, actually. Yeah. And, and in general, when it comes to like changing your uh, equipment or play style or whatever, uh, I agree with you that most people are probably more afraid to like change something with their play style rather than like not being afraid to do so. And if you notice that something's holding you back, you should try to fix it ASAP. Because for me, I played with a, I think the area was 40 width, 40 millimeter width. Uh, and I did that area for pretty much my entire time from six digit to three digit. I played with the exact same area. And because I was using such a small area, my pen grip was also like completely just weird. And 
<laughs> it, yeah, you don't. Don't. <laughs> don't. Yeah, if you notice that something is weird or if a lot of people comment on your like area or your play style and call it weird, it might be worth looking into. I'm not saying that other people should like say or tell you what to play with, but usually if like 20 people tell you, yeah, that might be a bit weird, then you should check it out. Right, right, for sure. Or if if nothing else, like if you can't find anyone else who does it the same way that you do, yeah, then you should at least like try to justify the reason why you're playing the way you are. Like if you have a good reason, like, oh, my grip is super, super low and I just prefer moving with my fingers or like, yeah. or Another thing is like some, sometimes you see people ask questions like, oh, should I try making my area bigger or should I try switching to index ring or something like that? And it's like, well, why don't you try it? <laughs> Worst case, you just switch back and you'll get the you'll get a more solid answer than anyone else could give you. Yeah, that's true. So let's see, there's another question that came in on the forum. Mm -hmm. who someone asked what should i do when i when i'm stuck at a specific star rating Ooh, okay so um in general and this is i think advice for pretty much anyone that's playing osu and wants to get good you should constantly be self-analyzing or trying to understand what you're good at and what you're bad at and why and by doing that, you're most likely going to find that you make very specific like types of mistakes or that there's one thing in specific that's holding you back from improving. So usually if you're stuck at a specific star rating for like more than, uh, let's say, a few months, let's say you've been there for like three months, there's probably something you're missing. And it's probably something you can fix if you just try to dig into your play style, uh, what maps you usually play. Are you playing like the same maps over and over? Because a lot of players say that they're stuck at a star rating when in reality, the reason like why they're stuck is because they've just been playing the same 20 or 30 maps over and over again. And I don't blame them because I've done the exact same thing and complained about being stuck. But yeah, you really need to analyze what you could be doing wrong potentially maybe get a friend or a coach or anyone to look at it and then try doing something different so a lot of players might be playing like six star when they're maybe not ready for it or six star is like out of their range but they keep playing it and they wonder why they're not getting used to it they're like oh i suck at six star so but i've been here for three months but the only thing they've been doing at six star is get b ranks with like 87 percent ac and yeah, then maybe you should take a step back, analyze, be like, okay, maybe I need to practice my streams a bit more on five star. Maybe I need to practice my cursor control or reading uh, like on easier star ratings. Yeah, that when you say like figure out what is holding you or like what you're good and bad at is mm -hmm. definitely something that a lot of people probably already like considered. But with the fact that you mentioned like also asking yourself why that's the case is yeah. something that's really really important because it, it can be like oh i'm good at jumps and i suck at streams but if you kind of just stop there then it's not really helpful because especially with streams there's so many things that go into it there's the tapping obviously and then there's the aiming and reading and finger control and and basically everything in between so yeah. being able to pinpoint exactly what is the issue for you is definitely going to help a lot a lot and on a similar note, it's like you could be like at a seven star level with your aim and with the reading, mm -hmm. but then like a four star level with your tapping, for example. And yeah. it's like recognizing your bottleneck is going to help you so, so much. Or honestly, I'd say like four star reading ability and like seven star aim and, and tapping, because I think that's probably a more common situation where like yeah. you're, you're getting held back by something that's almost invisible. And so... I think being able to recognize that in yourself and figure out what is actually holding you back is going to help so, so much. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah. like nowadays, we have so many tools for actually like figuring out what's wrong. 
So let's say you don't want to go the coaching route, like you don't want coaching from uh, a top player. You could always download Rewind or take a look at your replays in game. You could compare it to other players. You could watch YouTube videos talking about like why you might have these issues. You could watch streamers and see how they play. You could go and play two stars and three stars and four stars and be like, okay, maybe I suck for this reason. You could analyze your like own play on a map and then just check one of the like submitted let's say nomad scores if you were playing nomad and be like okay this guy has a lot more accurate aim but he's also snapping a lot more and i'm a lot more flowy with my aim so there's just a lot of i guess introspection that can be done with osu and most people like as you said they don't really go past like the first level they're like oh i'm good at jumps and i'm bad at streams and then they never touch streams ever they only play jump maps so like you really need to analyze everything and try to figure out what's going on okay yeah that's a really good point it's kind of like neglecting your weaknesses just because it's like oh well i don't play streams because i'm bad yeah. at them and then it's like okay omg how do people get good at streams question mark question mark <laughs> it's like well there's something you've been avoiding i don't know what to tell you but yeah yeah i think that's that's definitely a good point especially um just kind of in general oh and i'll also say mm -hmm. if uh, another thing is i know a lot of people have mentioned this around the community as well but like there's mm -hmm. a lot of discord servers where you can usually just go in and ask about your situation and someone or maybe a couple people will be more than happy to just give their input especially even oc university mm -hmm. is the server is basically always always active and there's a very supportive community here so this is definitely another very good place where if you're not really sure where to go to ask people about just kind of general any questions about osu in general then yeah osu university is definitely a good server to do that in yeah i kind of agree with what you just said but i kind of disagree with it as well oh, okay. because the thing is yeah sure you can ask for advice and most people will be happy to help and give you advice but you should always question who you're getting your advice from because i've seen six digits give advice to six digits and that usually leads in disaster oh, most right. of the time and five digits giving advice could be fine but you also have to look at the five digit what if the five digit has been playing for two thousand hours and there's still five digit then you're like okay what what have they been doing with their time i want to maybe get faster than this and like you have to really look at like every aspect of who you're actually getting advice from like you don't want to go ask about hidden advice from someone that like isn't good at hidden like you don't want to ask me how to get good at hidden when i can't play hidden that well and the thing with newer players asking about as advice as well is they don't really know what would be like good advice or who to ask really right so it's kind of like a weird situation where if you ask for advice hopefully you're gonna get something good but i've also seen people give like just completely terrible advice like six digits telling other six digits to focus on playing dt when they can't even do four star properly that's one that kind of makes me go huh <laughs> <laughs> and i've seen it a lot of times so yeah if you're gonna ask for advice definitely think a bit about who you're asking and have them explain why their advice is like a good idea yeah th there's a saying that i think is relevant here that goes something like if you want to figure out what to do or like if you want to make the right decision then ask for everyone's input but then don't listen to anyone and just make your own decision <laughs> which i think yeah. is a really good way to think about it because it's like even these interviews people who are listening to these interviews it's like we're not here prescribing the perfect way to do things we're just kind of giving our perspectives so that you can sort of take it in and use it in your own analysis and sort of agree with some things and disagree with other things like i think the most important thing that you can do when you're trying to learn really anything is to learn to reject certain beliefs if you don't feel like they're like accurate but at the same time you should always try to justify that other belief and like think through why that person probably thinks that because i mean surely there's some justification for what other people are saying as well so i think being yeah. able to 
at least understand what the other person is saying. And then from there, you can decide if that's something you want to agree with or not. I think that is an extremely good point because that's pretty much what I did with Osu. And the thing with Osu as well is you have like most players that actually do play Osu are usually very young and they have a lot of time to actually play. So you have a lot of time to actually test out these different strategies and see what works. So when I was like trying to get better at streaming and I wanted to learn how to stream, I literally just went on YouTube and searched like proper stream technique or how to get more stamina or just like very basic uh, how to videos. And I found some different techniques. I tried them and then I was like, hey, maybe this one works for me. And then I tested it out and turns out it worked really well. And yeah, as you said as well, you kind of have to analyze everything, take in everything and then like form your opinion and choose what to do from there. Because if we relate to this, if we relate this to something completely unrelated, let's say language learning, most people nowadays believe that getting good at languages means studying in textbooks, but that is not the case at all the way to you like get good at languages is by immersing in the language as, mu uh, as much as possible and as you can see i am from sweden and i would say that i have close to native abilities in english and i have never like formally taken classes besides i guess the school education but i was fluent in english before i even went to school and that was just by me like spending time um just like immersing playing minecraft watching youtube stuff like that and that's like completely contrary to what everyone or most people believe when it comes to learning languages because most people have to go to school and usually they take like spanish or french or german and yeah you really have to analyze everything and kind of see where everything comes from before you make your decisions yeah yeah for sure and going back to your point about like who you're taking advice from there's yeah. this similar concept this is mostly about like it, it's basically the saying that's like if you want to learn how to make money then don't take advice from millionaires take advice from billionaires because they've the, the reasoning basically is that they've crossed through every rung already and there might be some things that millionaires think is important but like once you pass a certain level you kind of realize it's not that important and you sort of relate this to osu as well where yeah Obviously, there's value in getting advice from people that are around your level as well, because sometimes people who have reached the top sometimes forget all the little phases that newer players kind of have to go through. But at the same time, I think it's you're usually going to get the most value out of the advice from someone who is basically a credible source in that sense. And yeah, I mean, it's also obviously possible that like, the advice that a six digit is giving is basically just them regurgitating or saying the exact same thing they've heard a top player say. So yeah. in that case, then sometimes it can obviously be helpful and it's essentially the same advice, but I think trying to be especially wary about the qualifications of whoever you're getting advice from. But yeah, as we said, I think the most important aspect of this is to take in everything and sort of think through it, but don't necessarily blindly copy just whatever you hear yeah i ac completely agree with that but also the part you mentioned where uh you said you don't necessarily have to ask a top player for advice and i completely agree with that you kind of just need to ask someone that has maybe specifically gone through the issues you've gone through and this is also why i feel like i'm qualified to coach or at least that was like the one thing I felt when I started coaching that I could like pride myself on. And mainly the fact that I pretty much had a very, very shitty start in the game. I used to play eight star maps when I was six digit. I used to play every mod. I used to push my limits every day. I never played easier maps. I never focused on like what I actually should have been focusing on. And I had to like pretty much just relearn the game with every single bad habit known to man. <laughs> so yeah if you find someone that is going through the same issues or someone that has gone through the same issues as you and they overcame them and they have very good results then asking them can also be a good idea so it doesn't have to be a top player yeah and sometimes it's it's tricky because the people who you look up to the most as at a particular skill set and people that have always been good at that skill set might yeah. not actually be that good at giving advice not because they're not a good player or not a good explainer but sometimes it just came so naturally to them that like they never went through the struggle that you're going through 
it's like if you say oh how do i get better at streams and you ask someone who has just kind of been a good stream player since day one and they just kind of naturally were able to use a proper technique and, and all that good stuff it's sometimes tricky to be able to get advice from them in a way that will help you yeah exactly and a lot of things in osu as well uh i don't know how many people agree with this view but the way i see it a lot of osu is like uh not instinct but kind of like you play osu and you kind of naturally know what to do on certain patterns mainly with like spacing if you're doing like space triples people are like wow how is he hitting them consistently every time it's because he's played similar patterns or played so much that it's kind of natural to him now right. and that's kind of hard to put into words so i've seen like players specifically ask about that like how do i do space streams exactly and that's a very hard que question to answer because when you like do space streams and you're able to keep that consistent flow you kind of just like know how to do it you can help people give or you can give people like the steps to get there but it's also very hard to explain to them why you're able to do that yeah, if that and makes sense. no, that, that that actually makes perfect sense. And the the way I always like to think about it is vague questions get vague answers. There's a reason why so many vague questions are answered with just play more because there's only so like you can say how do I get better at streams? Like there's it's such a broad question that it's like it can't even really be answered properly. So yeah, yeah. I think that's something good to throw out there. I, I do want to go back to what you mentioned about like people feeling hard stuck when they're playing the same, like they're just trying to push their limits, but they're only getting like 87% accuracy. Mm -hmm. I would say that that's actually a fine difficulty range to be in and sort of be challenging yourself on those maps because it's this sort of difficulty range where obviously there's mistakes that you're making, but the map is definitely doable enough for you to where you can, you're like, you're almost at that A rank um, threshold. So I think that's, a pretty safe range for if you're really trying to push your mechanical abilities but i would say anything under 75 percent accuracy is where you start running into like diminishing returns of like you're not you're most likely not getting the value that you think you are out of playing that map and you're probably better off playing something a little easier and building up gradually and then going back to that it's very similar to picking up a weight that's too heavy for you at the gym even if it's like kind of barely you can almost do it it's like if you can barely yeah. even do one or two reps then like sure you can pick up that weight but you're not getting as much value as you could be if you come back to it later yeah i kind of agree with that actually uh i kind of just threw out 87 percent as a random number random, out there. right yeah a bit a bit random i think 87 around 87 percent act if you're pushing your limits and you're really trying to develop those mechanics yeah that's fine but i wouldn't go as far to say as to say that like 75 percent is where you've gone too far i would say when you're getting c ranks you're you're kind of going too far now this doesn't apply to everyone obviously it I'd say it depends on what level you're at in the game because a C rank to a like top player or someone, let's say someone in like uh, rank 5,000 and above, a, a C rank to them isn't the same as a C rank to, let's say someone that's like 50K. I wouldn't say that's like they equate to the same thing. Well, I, it depends on the skill set for sure because yeah. they don't equate to the same capabilities as a player but they are the same like relative capabilities to their skill level so but yeah i think depending on the, the I, skill I meant set. more like i meant more like if you're getting a c rank as someone that's 50k and like you're pushing for c rank uh c ranks as someone that's 50k that will probably damage you more because you're not good enough at the game to play stuff that like actively ruins your consistency i guess and then just walk out of it unscathed whereas someone who is a lot higher rank could play stuff that pushes them like extremely hard without it really messing up their consistency do you get what i mean oh yeah yeah i see because they, they kind of already have that base yeah i see yeah I, I i would say as long as you're able to strike a balance between really pushing yourself mostly in the b rank range is i think really good or if you're getting like really high c ranks like sometimes 83 84 sometimes gives you a c rank but basically if you're able to feel that sort of like challenging but doable 
feeling when you play a map. Yeah. I think that's the ideal range for you to to be in for pushing yourself. And then as long as you're getting some practice in on simpler stuff or like just refining your gameplay overall, then mm -hmm. that is I think the perfect balance. So Yeah. Yeah, it definitely right. doesn't matter too much if you get like a C rank here or there, even if you're 50k. It's just that you shouldn't be mainly getting C ranks or B ranks. You kind of have to have that balance of pushing your limits and getting better at harder stuff while also refining and getting more consistent at stuff that you can kind of play. Right. Yep. I would definitely agree with that. All right. There's a question that came in from Leg912 who asks, was there a routine in your practice or did you just F2 and play the game? Ooh, this is a very good question. And in my case, I kind of just played the songs that I enjoyed. And since I really enjoy Japanese music or anime music, I didn't really have any issues with finding maps. So I would kind of just play whatever was within my skill range or a bit outside of my skill range, like generally what most people would play. But I would pretty much just have a lot of maps to pick and choose from because I generally enjoy most of the music in Osu. And I know a lot of players that absolutely like hate anime songs. And because of that, they're kind of very limited in what they can play. And this usually leads to them having to play maps that are either too hard or too easy for them and kind of puts them in this like gray zone where they can't like improve the way they want to because they don't have enough maps to actually facilitate having fun and actually enjoying the game because they don't like like anime songs as an example but if you're asking about uh like specifically if i f2 to like try to have as much variety as possible or if i replayed maps over and over again it's kind of a mix because sometimes you're going to find a map where let's say you play it once and you get let's say 87 percent ack but something in you tells you shit you can probably get 96 or 97 on this if you give it a few more tries then i'd probably retry the maps a few times or retry the map a few times try to like figure out if I'm doing this correctly, if there's something I could do better, and then I might eventually move on. But being able to sight read and like F2ing a lot and playing a lot of different maps is extremely important if you're trying to get good because your reading will improve so much by being exposed to a variety of different patterns. So if you're mainly only playing like one type of map and that's like the only thing you play, you're missing out on a lot of potential for like developing your reading. Yeah, I think... The song choice, especially that you mentioned, like you kind of just gravitated towards the songs that you like playing the most. Yeah, it's it's actually it's tricky, and I definitely feel for some players, especially people who like um, metal songs, because a lot of those maps are just really really hard. And so, as a beginner player, it can be kind of frustrating that you kind of have to work your way up. But yeah, I definitely would agree, especially in that like. For for one, having that variety, like you mentioned, is really, really important, especially for just developing yourself as a player overall. It's very similar to kind of like being educated on many different topics. It's like it just kind of gives you much more diversity in what you're able to do, I guess. But yeah, as, aside from that, just I think playing maps or songs that you have the most fun with is definitely going to keep you the most motivated and just continue yeah. to enjoy the game and keep pushing yourself someone in the chat asked what's f2 so f2 is the shortcut to pick a random map so when we say f2 we're basically talking about just kind of playing whatever map um, or sometimes literally talking about just pre pressing the random map button in your song list and just kind of playing random maps throughout your session yeah and i've coached people before that like really really have a huge issue with not being able to like play new maps like they just don't really like the music that much and they keep playing the same maps over and over again and they develop this weird but cool strategy i guess they press f2 and then they instantly press enter so they don't even like see what map they get they just f2 enter and then they start playing oh i've i've tried that a couple times it's 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 a pretty cool way to play the game, actually. I don't do it all the time, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's definitely not uh, not necessarily bad, I would say. Yeah. All right. Well, do you have any last opinions or things you want to shout out 
as we wrap up. I think we've had a lot of really, really good and insightful answers so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, I just want to see that the Osu community has fun playing the game. And I kind of just want to say that I know a lot of players are very fixated on improvement and that just talking about improvement, discussing improvement and focusing on it is very fun for them. But you kind of also have to step away sometimes and that might in the end be the best decision for your improvement overall. Because for me, when I started off playing Osu, I didn't like interact with any communities until I was like rank 30k, which today might be like 50 or 60k, I don't know, somewhere around there. Like I made sure to get fairly good at Osu, or to a decent level before I focus too much on like the community and all of that because I think you can come into very bad habits where you compare yourself too much to other players and the only thing that happens is you like write recent in a scores channel and then 10 <laughs> other people come and type compare and you're like oh well shit that just ruined my day so uh yeah I guess that's my message to the community <laughs> Yeah, definitely wise words. There's actually two other questions that came in specifically to you. So I oh. do want to touch on those before we end. So right. the first one is, oh, they're actually both anonymous. One says, mm -hmm. how can you stay consistent and stop shaking when you're going for a score? Yeah, this is an extremely good question. <laughs> and I feel like it fits me very well because um, I don't usually say that Osu is genetics, but damn. I'm also is genetic sometimes, man. Why do I have to have the worst shake and nerve <laughs> genetics ever? Uh, I don't know. That's like very good question. Like ever since I started playing, I've had like the biggest nerves and shake ever. And the only way I really found to kind of counter this is just to get used to it. And there are different ways of getting used to it. Uh, yet again, another uh, like practice example that I got from Idki was... When you play a map and let's say you're FCing and then you miss at the end because you got too nervous and you started shaking, the first thing you should do is instantly replay the map. Like right afterwards, while you're still shaking, nervous, and you can like barely play, you want to kind of play the map one more time to get a feel for it when you actually have those nerves. And there's like different ways to put yourself in this situation as well. Uh, for some reason, I used to get very nervous when my older brother watched me play. So I'd be playing Osu, just having fun, chilling, setting some scores, and then he would enter the room and just stare at me while I played. And that would make me almost like miss everything. <laughs> so you can put yourself in different situations where you get nervous. It's kind of um, artificial, but it's still like the best way to get used to nerves and shake just get used to being really really nervous and really shaky while you're playing and over time you're gonna stop missing as much you're gonna start fc'ing more and everything's just gonna go better and even though you like shake and it goes really well like really bad you're not really performing that well just because you've practiced it so much, it's going to go better than you think. Because I remember playing OWC 2021, a, a, yeah, 2021, and the first map ever I played, I was so nervous, I couldn't feel my hands at all. Oh. I couldn't feel my tapping hand, I couldn't feel my aim hand. I was sitting there with, like, numb hands playing, but I FC'd the first map. And then right after that, I started screaming. I was like, holy, how did, how did I do that? And then the captain says, all right, you're going in for the next map as well. And then I had to do it one more time, and somehow I also FC'd the second map. So two FCs in a row on OWC debut somehow, Jeez. while... I was shaking and having like a heart attack. So the best thing you can do is just get used to it. Because I think for some people, it can be very hard to get rid of nerves and shake. So you, you have like two options. Either you practice like not getting nervous, which is also good, but that's like a completely different discussion. And then you should also practice what to do or how to play when you're nervous. Yeah, I think getting used to it is definitely one of those strategies that can help a lot of players. And yeah. as you mentioned, it's not a situation that you're always in. So when you do find yourself feeling a little nervous after a map, that's actually the perfect window of opportunity for you to play the map immediately again, instead of kind of sitting there and waiting for your hands and everything to calm down. I think using that as an opportunity to practice being able to play through nerves is, is very, very helpful. Yeah, exactly. Because nerves isn't something you can practice like whenever you want to. You can only practice it when you're actually nervous or you're shaking. 
So you can put yourself in these artificial situations, as I said before. For example, if you have an elder sibling or just friends that watch you play, or if you sit in VC and you play while streaming, or if you like stream on Twitch, anything that makes you nervous, you should do it and get used to it while playing. All right, the last question that came in is, what are your thoughts on people 200 K rank and lower who are a one trick of mods like hidden hard rock double time or Ooh. HDHR or HDDT. All the good questions are coming in. All right. <laughs> uh, this is a very good question. And this is something I have thought about a lot, mainly because I used to be one of those players. And I would say contrary to popular belief and what you probably see a lot of players do playing mods as a newer player could potentially be the worst thing you ever do in osu it could be but it completely depends as well but i would say as like a rule of thumb you shouldn't really touch mods until you feel very very confident with your no mod ability because sure you can play mods when you're new and get good at uh get good at the mods and like see good improvement but there's also a lot of bad things that could happen so as an example right now i'm also streaming on twitch and i have two viewers in here i have skilla and tony reno and both of them are hidden players and when they started off playing osu they mained hidden and that eventually led to them becoming close to four digit or around four digit not being able to play anything except for hidden and the thing that sucks with that is they're very good tourney players now but this meant that they had to relearn nomad and practically the entire game from when they were already really good and i mentioned this before with practicing like skill sets you're not good at or like things like that where you'd struggle it is extremely pay painful and imagine having to like relearn the game when you like you're already super good at the game but then you have to like relearn nomad and yeah both of them have told me that it's like the one of the most p painful things they have done in uh, osu so I don't recommend playing mods when you're new. You should maybe start dabbling with mods when you're like around 50k. I would even say like 30k or like when you're at the point where you can start playing tournaments. That's when you should like start getting into mods more because you can make it extremely far with no mod. And most players usually look at top players and like, hey, this top player is playing this, so I want to play this. But they don't realize that most top players got really good at no mod or had very good no mod ability before they like went full DT mode or hard rock mode, as an example. Right. I would touch on hidden in particular because I almost feel like. I mean, p people do say that hidden is one of the most like preference-based mods, and mm -hmm. in some sense, I could imagine some people saying that like, isn't starting with no mod and then learning like kind of relearning how to read with hidden later, kind of the same as starting with hidden and then relearning how to read with no mod later as well? Um, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that because if you start off with no mod you kind of have the base for everything else if you have if you start off with no mod and focus on no mod you can practice dt afterwards and it's not going to be the biggest thing ever and you can practice like hard rocks not going to be the biggest thing ever and people might say well you can just like put on uh hidden for those but let's say you wanted to play tournaments then you're likely going to be forced to play like hard rock only and dt only so no matter what, you're most likely going to have to learn no mod and no mod is going to have or is likely going to be the base for everything. So in my opinion, it just becomes a lot more like troublesome and just annoying if you have if you start off with hidden because there's just so much more you have to fix. And yeah, like if you want to play tournaments as well, like just another example, because I, I was a tournament player. Um like there is usually four to six maps in just the nomad category so if you can't play nomad and that's going to be your weakest link uh I'd, I'd rather have like hidden be my weakest link rather than nomad be my weakest link if that makes sense right especially for tournaments that's definitely yeah. a good point because nomad is basically like the vanilla version of osu where everything is sort of like everything branches out from your nomad ability and yeah. that's especially, as you mentioned, seen in tournaments where you have like 
usually around six maps that are forced for you to play with Nomad. But then there's usually three maps that you can play with Hard Rock only and that will like without hidden. And then there's four maps that are DT only without hidden as well. So yeah, and, and I've definitely seen reports of people who played hidden only and everything was fine until they wanted to start playing tournaments. And then they're like, oh my God, I literally cannot read approach circles and I just need to like relearn how to read with Nomad. So yeah, I would say if, if tournaments aren't really something you care about, then I think in that case, it's not a big deal to just kind of play however you want, especially with hidden in particular as that's like mostly a preference thing but for hard rock and double time i would especially agree that jumping into it too early like before i would say the way i think of it is like you can start playing hard rock and double time whenever you feel like it's the next like natural step for you like for ar mm -hmm. for example so hard rock you generally think of as ar10 or sometimes ar9.8 on once yeah. you start getting to like four stars then at that point it's like you whenever it's the next natural step for you to get there because when you're learning ars you might go from like ar7 to 8 to 9 to like 9.3 and 4 and once the next step for you becomes like 9.8 and 10 ar then that's mm -hmm. where hard rock starts to become useful but that doesn't happen for a very long time and you don't want to skip to that too early and basically skip some foundational steps before then yeah, because that's something I usually show most people when I do my coaching sessions. I go in and I type AR equals like 10 or AR equals 9.9, 9.8. And I just show them how few maps actually exist that have like very high AR. And the ones that actually do exist are like 7 star, 6 star, 8 star. And then I show them that even if you're playing like 4 star and you put on AR... Or, four star is usually ar8 and if you play four star with hard rock it instantly becomes ar10 so usually people do jump into mods and they do it way too early which does lead to a lot of bad habits and if you're very like adamant about playing mods and you really want to play mods then destroy no mod as fast as possible just focus everything on getting good at no mod and then you can play as much like mods as you want later on yeah. And that would be like more efficient overall. And that will also make playing mods more fun because instead of like struggling with mods, you're actually going to be able to play them because your no mod level is good enough to support it. Yeah, I think if you're just able to stay on the grind and just move up and up with no mod, like just go from AR9 to 9.3 with AR for one and also OD is really important yeah. because OD sometimes you can only find up to like 8.5 or sometimes 9 there's like a i guess now nowadays there's more od9 no mod maps but i think mm -hmm. that's also something that you kind of have to start building up and and od for those who aren't familiar is basically accuracy like how hard it is to act but yeah so what i'm hearing is that you should definitely avoid trying to one trick mods if you're a newer player even hidden mostly because of tournaments where you yeah. kind of want to start off with no mod first so yeah, that definitely makes yeah. sense. And that's also one thing I want to talk about. Most players, and I did the exact same thing, so I can kind of understand why people would think this way. They think that they won't ever get to a point where they can naturally play mods or where they can like naturally play the higher star or higher difficulty maps. Because a lot of players start playing and then they just spam seven star, six star, and eight star because they want to play them now and most people have kind of like this mentality in the back of their head that they won't ever actually be able to play them properly and like FC them and get good scores. But that's usually very far from the truth. And the more you actually focus on like getting good first, the more you'll be able to actually enjoy the harder maps and actually like get good scores on them. And the reason why this is so like hard for a lot of players to believe is because like you can't really see into the future or believe that you'll get very good when you're so new to the game. If someone told me when I was new to the game that I would be a rank or at my peak, I'd be top 500, that I would have played OWC and all of this stuff, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have really believed them if I'm being honest. Yeah, I think having that confidence to know that if you just kind of go through those steps that you too will be able to get to you know being able to play all these super hard maps very comfortably and yeah 
being able to sort of look back on how far you've come. But yes, very, very insightful. I feel like I just spent the last 90 minutes just absorbed in wisdom. So thank you for all of your very insightful answers. And are there any places where people can get in touch with you or any places where people can find you aside from your OC profile? Uh, yeah, so I'm actually going to be making a lot of OSU related content soon on my new YouTube channel, since I'm not really playing that much right now because I don't have that much time. So I'm going to be making a lot of YouTube videos that are like focused on improvement, talking about different techniques, because I really don't see enough of those videos. And on some videos, the advice isn't really the best because I've seen a lot of videos where people recommend long stream maps and like in their eyes that might be a good idea but from what i've seen i personally don't agree with that so i think it might be good to put up some videos that kind of just give you both sides of how you can improve and like what to look out for so can i like link my channel somewhere oh yeah yeah, yeah of course and it'll be linked in the description for those listening on youtube as well but yes, yes. thanks again and uh are you are you f on Twitter or Twitch or anywhere else? Uh, I am on Twitch, but I barely stream, but I can link that as well. All right. At twitch.tv slash masterosu. Let's go. Yeah, you can <laughs> link those in the, in the live chat. But thanks everyone for listening and tuning in and join us in two and a half hours, actually, for another interview with Gerbsy. So look forward to that. But thanks again, Master, for joining. I'm sure we will see you again many, many more times. And yeah, I will see you all around. All right. Thank you for having me on. And I wish everyone a good rest of their day.